and welcome to another episode of Frightfully Forgotten Horror Movies, but what are we drinking? Wolf's Bane, English Bitter. Today we're going to bring to you another Canadian movie shot in 1979, but the release date is a little sketchy. Some say it's 1980, some say it's 82, 84, 84 so <laughs> anywhere from 80 to 84, and the movie is Deadline. The movie's directed by Mario as a party. Stephen Young is in this as the main lead, and he is in uh, quite a few things. He's kind of like a prolific Canadian actor, but one major movie he was in was Soylent Green. <laughs> Marvin Goldhar is in this. 80s Canadian kids might recognize his voice uh -huh. from an 80s Canadian standard being the Raccoons. Yeah. He plays Cedric Sneer. <laughs> yeah. We get introduced to Stephen Lessey. He's a famous horror novelist and he's also a screenwriter. A lot of his movies and ideas are getting put onto the big screen. Sounds familiar. Mm -hmm, yeah. He comes downstairs for breakfast and you kind of get the sense that he's working far too hard. He's never around. Why do you work so much, Daddy? <laughs> I gotta work hard to, to pay for this big house and to, to get money to pay for you. He's going to be the recipient of an award and he's got to go to the university to go get it. Turns out that he actually has to defend his work against all these people who think that his work is like corrupting people's minds yeah. nowadays. Trashing the horror genre. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Him and his wife get into the car and his wife starts laughing at him just about the whole scene and he hits her. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry, right away, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> we also see that he's getting a lot of pressure from his producer to start pumping out these scripts that are sort of cookie cutter. He doesn't want to do this anymore. He's sick of this shit. I want to do something else. I want to take my work to the next level. His kids are like coming up to him even asking for like a glass of water. You're gonna have to get it yourself. I'm just too busy. It's like... <laughs> His wife ends up coming home just fucking smashed. Falls into that side table and yeah. smashes that <laughs> vase yeah. all up. Puts her into the bed and she's passed out and he's like, You goddamn motherfucking bitch! You know? <laughs> <laughs> fucking just smacks her one while she's passed out. <laughs> That's not good. They go to a party. They're not even with each other. She's off in her own little yeah, world. Yeah. And you find out that neither of them organized a babysitter. <laughs> right. They just left the kids at home, right? They're like, oh, they call her. I gotta, I gotta go call my mom and maybe she'll come over and watch the kids. I was working, yeah. goddammit. Steven's on the set of the movie they're shooting and him and the main actress are always clashing. You know, she wants <laughs> she wants better dialogue, something that's meaningful, and they're filming this scene where she's gotta cut the head off this monk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Says all this mumbo jumbo and <laughs> cuts off the head and she's like, ah shit! I don't feel it! Yeah, yeah, I don't know, I don't feel anything, I don't feel it. Feel what? <laughs> this is all shit. <laughs> So even he knows that he's just writing this garbage, right? Yeah. He's driving home, tunes into the radio, and he hears his reporter talking. Children were playing and reenacting part of a, a horror movie, and the tragedy has happened, and one of them has been killed. And he's yeah. like, ah, and he turns it off. Right, and right. Pulls into his driveway, and there's all these cops there, and you find out it was his kids that he heard about on the radio. Oh, man. And they were watching one of his movies called The Executioners, and they're trying to reenact a scene of like a hanging. The mom comes home and starts flipping out, losing her mind, and they start blaming each other, right? Yeah. He starts blaming the kids yeah. for doing what they did. Starts super <laughs> shaking that kid. What have I done to you bastards? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Calling his yeah. kids bastards? Wife and kids leave him, and he just spirals out of control. And that's where we're gonna leave the plot off. If you wanna find out what happens, Watch the movie, Deadline, 1980, or 82, 82 or 84. <laughs> it's pretty obvious that the movie is a huge social commentary. There's a lot of stuff about the movie business, right? Artists and what they have to go through when they're yeah. under a lot of pressure to make other people money. And happy, yeah. <laughs> right? The guy can't write what he wants to write, he's got to write what... The producer says we'll make money. Exactly. And it's, he's miserable and he can't do it anymore. He's yeah. sick of kind of selling out. It also shows the effects of too much pressure. He's under so much pressure 
that he starts to defer a lot of stuff to his wife. Because he's been working so much, their relationship has been failing. Yeah. So his wife is buggering off out of the house all the time, and she's not looking at after the kids or the household or anything yeah. and he doesn't even notice yeah and he isn't either so yeah. nobody's doing it <laughs> exactly there's got to be accountability right in a relationship the kids are on the sidelines kind of being the biggest losers in the whole thing here sympathize with the situation he's in yeah. not necessarily with him yeah right it's that's like that's right. eh, a shitty position that you're put in but you're kind of an asshole. Yeah, I don't really feel too sorry <laughs> for you. I feel more sorry for the kids. Just because you're under a lot of pressure doesn't mean you have to be an asshole. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's also cool how it's commentary on the horror genre. You right. know, that big debate in the university. Well, this is garbage and this isn't really <laughs> art. And the fact that he really wants to write something truly terrifying. But nobody gives a shit, right? Right. They just want They don't money. want your best. Yeah. yeah. They just want the cookie cutter stuff yeah. that'll make money. It parallels real life too, right? With, I think, Stephen King. Yeah. Right? <laughs> at the time, was the big horror writer. All his books were being turned into movies at the time. You that's, know? that's right, yeah. yeah. And there's <laughs> even the director of the movie they're making <laughs> is a spitting image of 1970s John Carpenter, too. The it's, mustache. Yeah, and so everything. it's like, they know what they're doing. They know that they're spoofing, or at least they're trying to mirror real life, you know? Yeah, the, that's right. The famous horror director with the famous horror writer, you know? Yeah. It's not crammed down your no, throat no though. no no and no. but but it's obvious that's a fine line there the acting in the dialogue in this movie are spectacular i, I think yes. it's one of the best written movies as far as the dialogue goes that i've seen where it's like this is how people talk yeah this is how people get into arguments this is you know the foul stuff that comes out of people's mouths when they're pissed off like yeah the stuff that comes out of his mouth you fucking bitch yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's like smacking. it's like whoa it kind of it takes you back a bit how visceral it is, but it's like, that's realistic yeah. when, you're, when you're in the heat of the moment. Stupid shit comes out of your mouth. A lot of Canadian movies hide the fact it's Canadian. It either right. doesn't take place in Canada, and they don't want to let you know, oh, this is uh, New York. Yeah. This movie, they don't hide the fact it's Canadian. They mention the fact it takes place in Toronto. They show the CN Tower. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, I kind of like the fact they're not hiding it. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's Canadian. And there's even a comment about Canadian movies being shitty <laughs> in the movie, which is pretty good. It's pretty funny. It knows what it is, right? Yeah. It's funny because Canadian movies aren't all that bad. No, actually. but they have that stick. <laughs> Stigma, right? Yeah, I got exactly. that look. Coming back to the horror aspect of this movie, the score for this movie is actually really, really good. It's so somber. There's a lot of cool snippets interjected throughout yeah. the whole movie. So his some ideas. of his, yeah, his ideas going through his mind while he's working. Like that lady taking the shower in that mm -hmm. early 80s with all the black tiling and yeah, in the, the bathroom. Tub. Yeah. Blood, all the red blood coming down, and it looks spectacular. I love the contrast of all the colors in that. It's great. Yeah, it's awesome. Some guy working on a thresher and there's like a goat. <laughs> Some goat's yeah. all watching him. The goat has, I guess, powers or something and starts to turn the threshing machine on and it starts to tear his limbs off and everything. <laughs> yeah, and it looks great. Yeah, it's the really good. are really good. <laughs> There's another real long segment of this idea he has, which is ludicrous. It would, it would, it would, it would make for an awful movie. Nazi punk bands all yeah. playing, and then this kind of Nazi scientist comes, and, oh, I have this new invention, it's a, a new sound system, and it will deliver <laughs> frequencies that will make people shit their pants <laughs> at the yeah. concert. Like, what kind of premise for a movie is that? And they give bombs yeah. booze. Yeah, they and wheel in all these bums <laughs> on, like, <laughs> in wheelbarrows. And <laughs> they're the test subjects. <laughs> they all start, like, <laughs> exploding because of this <laughs> punk music. There's another good one, too, with an old lady where it just shows, like, these kids bring an old lady, like a grandma. Yeah, no, grandma, let's play, grandma. This is fun. Lay her into the bed and start tying her up. She's all, oh, this is fun. Yeah, this is fun. And then they all light her on fire. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Another neat one where there's all these nuns start yeah. like eating the priest and everything. Yeah. The imagery Dude. is really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really awesome. But after his daughter dies and he keeps having visions of her and he yeah. sees her hanging, it's like, whoa, it's fucking haunting. Like, that's, that's a little girl there in that noose swinging. That's right. There's no bullshit. There's no dummy. 
And when they show her, like, hanging, and the kids are struggling to kind of untie it, and they're not doing it in time, it's yeah. like, whoa! <laughs> yeah. That's it's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, and it's something that you you don't see nowadays. I don't think like, you would see that nowadays. So it's pretty neat that this movie actually really isn't a horror movie. It's kind no. of more of a drama, but it's about horror movies. Yeah. And it's about horror, and it's about what, you know, how horror affects people or could affect people, how the general public viewed it at the time as, like, not art, as garbage. Exactly, and this movie is actually the complete opposite. It is pretty artsy. Yeah. When and, you think about and it. And it's saying something yeah. about art, it, about relationships, about horror as a genre. About everything, yeah. really. About the, the time, the culture of the yeah. time. It's a fucking smart movie. It's pretty deep. Yeah. For a kind of a forgotten movie, you know, that's... It has a lot to say about a lot of things. And it's Canadian, no less. Yeah. <laughs> so kudos to us. Yeah, so if you want to check out a really smart movie about the horror genre and about the people who create it, then definitely check out 1980-somethings Deadline. <laughs> Deadline. And until next time, keep drinking.